Welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Uh, all registered political parties for this weekend's governorship election are busy putting finishing touches to their preparations. The People's Democratic Party is the main opposition party there, and its candidate, Eita Ajaga, the senior advocate of Nigeria, is considered to have a credible chance of upstaging the incumbent, Rotimi Akiri Dolu, of All Progressive Congress, ABC. At this point, we are linking up with our crew in Akure, the capital of Ondo State, to have a conversation with Shegun Shongumi, a member of the People's Democratic Party and former spokesperson for the Atikwa Worker Presidential Campaign Organization. Uh, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure uh, talking to you, Mr. Shongumi, if you can hear me all the way in Akure. Uh, Mr. Shongumi, I will start... I can hear you. Great. I will start with a peace accord signed yesterday. But I think that peace accord is quite funny because I was on the road uh, on Sunday passing through Ore when... I stopped and some people were telling me about the mayhem, the free-for-all shooting that was happening in Akure that same Sunday. Next thing I see is a peace accord. A lot of Nigerians would like to know, are we truly serious about this? Well, I think that uh, the principle of the peace accord has been around for some time, heavily led by the former president of our country, His Excellency Abdul Salam Abubakar. And very eminent personalities like Hassan Kuka, uh, uh, Archbishop Naikan, and a few others. The principle and the idea is very firm. It has become part of our election architecture that we fall into. Whether we'll be able to say that the signing of one accord, a couple of days to an election, will make up for the mayhem and the lack of restraint that we have seen through the campaign, that's a different kettle of fish. I believe that until we are extremely serious about having zero tolerance to Togri, either because the police will not tolerate it or the powers that be will not even have anything to do with it, then we will not be able to solve that problem. Of course, elections are very emotive things. With the campaign narrative and all that, they get to a crescendo, and followers can become very animated. And sometimes they do things, you wonder who's put them to it, but I'll just say that what we, our experience as PDP has been that we have heard the police, people have been arrested, and some people have bailed them. The question is, we have not bailed anybody, so who's been bailing them? But that's what's under the bridge. Let us just say that everybody has turned a new leaf. They have now moved away from being Saul, and they are ready to be Paul. We have signed the accord yesterday. You can see from the public comments and all of that. But they, we'll see how the next couple of this play out, especially the D-Day, which is Saturday. And we're hoping that selection of leaders in an election is a franchise that has been given to the people. And the people must be made to have a comfortable atmosphere by which to exercise this franchise. Can, parties should campaign. Candidates should crisscross the nook and cranny of the environment or the political space that they're contesting for. But anything other than that is not acceptable. And certainly... We stand for peace. We believe in the principle of peace. We have always been peaceful people. It's our Jagede ran election in 2016, even though they were the ones that were in power then. Nobody had any complaint of violence. And obviously, we didn't win that time. And there was really no complaint of violence or mayhem or breakdown. If there is a new uh, breakdown and everybody's a bit embarrassed as to what has become of a peace loving on those states, then we have to look to those who have the responsibilities to maintain peace in the states. Well, Shagun, I mean, the question I'm going to ask you is good to see you. Uh, welcome again to the morning show. I'd like you to wear your cap as an analyst, not as a party man who is on the yeah. ground in... Uh, in I uh, try very hard. I try very hard, Dr. Ruben. I try very hard. <laughs> not always on those states to help, uh, you know, the candidate of your party, the uh, People's Democratic Party. How you rate the three leading candidates yeah. in terms of their strengths and weakness? I think that... I think that um, the election is going to be like a two-way horse between uh, the candidates of uh, APC, uh, Rotimi Akiri Dulu SAN, and the candidate of the PDP, Itaro Jagede SAN. I think that on the money, you will say it's going to be a very tight race because both sides have tried the best they can. What works for one may be a disadvantage for the other. What works for the other may be an advantage for one. For instance. It will naturally be expected that if the process does not get excessively monetized, then the People's Democratic candidate may have the day. But if the people of Ondo succumb to money pressure, buy and cook, cook and buy and all of that, only God knows how much resources of state 
the incubators will be able to deploy. Also, they all have their strength areas. As far as we can see in the OWA, which is the northern central axis, we'll have to call it a strong area for the APC candidate, Rotimi, and Rotimi Akiri Dulu SAN, because it comes from OWA. And we've noticed that primordial sentiment is very high here. They do not have so much of a religious sentiment driving campaign here, but the primordial one does. So possibly he will do well in OWA. But the good thing for us there is that Eta Ajegede, our candidate, also has his maternal roots in Ikpele, which is also within that axis. But when it comes to the center, the Akure proper proper, where you have the largest number of votes, I mean, available for casting, then you say that the Eta Ajegede will be very strong here. Why? Akure has never produced a governor here, and there's no reason why the Prime Minister Paris part of the state will not be yearning to support their son. When you go to Undo Axis, what we notice there is that there may be some flashes of brilliance from the Zeni Labour Party, not because of Agbola truly, but because of uh, Olusegun Rama Mimiko, who is a bit of a force there. But luckily, Olusegun Rama Mimiko has a lot of foot soldiers who are traditionally PDP people who are also rooting to give us numbers there. And we're going to be having our final rally there today. We'll be able to gauge the mood of the people and their level of exit. As far as the water side area, which is a rural area, the, the southern senatorial district, beg your pardon, is divided into basically two flanks. The, the, uh, the what do they call them, the water riverine area and the Okitipukwa area. In the riverine area, it's divided into two. Uh, Aida Tewa, the deputy governor of the APC, is coming from there. And the Zenith Labour Man, the third force, is also coming from there. And they have not enough numbers to match what is happening in the Okitipukwa axis of it. Around the Okitipukwa axis of it, that's where we have taken our own deputy governorship candidate. It's been traditionally PDP. They are very, very rooted in uh, Urushegu Agagua, PDP, and I think Bol Boluga is also a tested hand who the people love. So I believe that we'll, have, we'll split that area almost in three equal halves, or possibly maybe one of them may edge us out, or we may edge them out. But when you pull it all together, what you will find out is that three things are driving this campaign the way I see it. People are, on, people are willing to say, oh, we like the personality, the look, the candor of the PDP candidate. So there's a lot of, you know, very strong emotions following him. Let's also hope that it translates into votes. We also notice that naturally every election for an incumbent is like a referendum. People will have a lot to say as to how they've been served in the last three and a half or almost four years now. And three things stick out around um, Akiri Dulu SAN. One is that people feel that he has reduced governance to a patrimony of himself and his family members. So people believe that he has done a lot of pro-people policies, especially around education and health because of the price. Sometimes they, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult situation to place because you ask, should you produce education at a cost that the people cannot really afford? Or should you produce education at an optimal level where the people can easily assess it? Obviously, he's going to have to bite the bullet there. And then the final one is that there is an attitude and a conduct that people are used to here. When you speak, when you speak down at, at traditional rulers, when you seem to be a little bit your way of the highway, and when the civil servant don't feel connected to you, it's a problem. But again, like I always say, every election is a bespoke event. You cannot really predict absolutely in real time how people will behave. But if the exit polls, the straw polls, the fillers we are getting is anything to go by, then I'll call it for PDP, and that is being as objective as I can possibly be. Well, of course you're always going to call it for PDP, <laughs> Mr. Shomi. But let's talk about the electoral umpire, INEC. What do you make of INEC's performance recently? How confident are you? Because it's really unfortunate, it's sad, I have to say, for PDP to be having to issue preemptive warnings to INEC that, look, you better not rig these elections. Now, I'll tell you what, um, the... Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has to understand that all of Nigerians commended them on Edo, and therefore the integrity quotient has risen a little bit. It cannot be a flash in the pan. It has to be something that people will say, okay, this is the new normal. And therefore, people are only waiting nervously to see whether INEC would deliver something better than Edo, an improvement on Edo, if you ask me. And as such, there could be a bit of free nerves, suspicion. Are they, is the APC too desperate to have them, you know, use power that be, and all of those things that people speak in congestions and basically things that are not substantiated, they can't be substantiated until after the event. I am of the firm belief that the integrity of INEC is at stake. 
I listened to the chairman of INEC during the peace accord, and something resonated with me. I saw before me a man who understands that he is standing before history. And I believe that between himself and his workers and all of the people in INEC, I believe that they will deliver an election that all of us can be proud of. After all, when they did their do, the international community commended them, these uh, observer groups commended them, all the parties commended them, the whole of Nigeria commended them. We should get to a point where election will certainly not be war, neither will election be a heist of votes or a rigging machine or an orgy of violence. And of course, there's a part of it that has to do with INEC, which has to do with the fact that they say the man who casts the vote counts for nothing. It is the man who counts it. The one that has casted it is not as important as the one who counts it. And therefore, if the process is transparent, if there's integrity through it, then I can tell you that INEC and the whole of Nigeria, indeed all, our, all lovers of Nigerians and friends of Nigeria, will be happier for it. And thank goodness God, the international community have tried to demonstrate that they are very determined to encourage Nigeria to make the right level of progress in democracy by issuing the usual kind of warning that, hey, we are all watching. And therefore, I believe that INEC will be above board. But then again, you know, it's a one-day event. So much is packed into that one day. If everything goes well that day, then obviously everybody will be happy. And if anything goes bad that day, then people have to take responsibility for their actions and inactions. I'm really excited you talked about the international community uh, giving those travel bans. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of reaction to it, even from uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Nigeria and, and the likes. Uh, do you think that will have effect uh, on the key stakeholders of this election in any way, in on those states? I believe, I, believe, I believe that since you're going to be punished in your individual capacity, I believe that at the end of the day, you're going to have to take a, a, you know, do a survey and ask yourself, am I prepared to endanger and prevent my family members, my friends and associates from being able to have access to some of the freedom that is guaranteed by movement? Yes, nations are entitled to their sovereignty and they can use their sovereignty as they like, but there's also some level of shuttle diplomacy and persuasive uh, you know, consequences that can help people to behave well. And therefore, I believe that if anyone who is high up there knows that he could be prevented from traveling, he could have some much more consequences from the international community, or more importantly, he could even become a pariah, I think that that will influence them a little bit. Because you, sometimes when we talk about an event in a collective manner, you don't really get people to comply because nobody is, nobody is we. But when you have to talk about I and people's names are going to be put on, you know, visa bans in their individual capacity for themselves and their family, I know that it, they could be very persuaded. Well, uh, Shagun, there is a story on the front page of uh, This Day Today uh, titled, INEC expresses Ooh. concern over violence in Ondo. Um, the same concern was expressed about the uh, gubernatorial election in Edo State on September 19th. But the INEC chairman, when he spoke at that uh, peace accord uh, event yesterday, uh, was talking about how the environment in Ondo State is charged. And they must have seen something for him to say, look, there is uh, a very potent threat of uh, violence. But you are on the ground there. Uh, how charged is that uh, mm. environment with regard to the ability of INEC to conduct a peaceful, free, fair, and credible election? And meanwhile, uh, you call the uh, election for PDP, naturally. But the APC is projecting that they win that election with about 55 to 58 percent of the uh, votes. And don't forget the fact that incumbency uh, is a strong factor. We saw it at play in Kogi, in Edo. Uh, why should the outcome be different in uh, Undo State with an incumbent uh, governor who has also been saying that nobody can get him out of that place for a second time? And that your candidate, in any case, is from the uh, wrong part of the, uh, of the state with regard to zoning formula. Okay, thank you. I think I'll take the, the last part first. A candidate that is primed to win as a result of incumbency cannot struggle on narrative. If you observe the campaign of the APC and their candidate, they have struggled a lot on narrative. You, can hardly, you cannot even quickly say these are the three things they're running on. And if you watch the, can, the campaign of us, the APC, the PDP and the Itaio Jagede, you will notice that we have musicalized it. We have turned it into a dance drama. Everywhere you go, you see our people singing and dancing, a yoke, and all that. That's not something to reflect that we're nervous. 
And in terms of the, the zoning arrangement, you see, we do not zone for the purposes of just zoning. We zone so that we can look for competence, capacity on the ticket. And in this particular instance, one of them has been tested. He has even failed according to the ways people have known him before. How can you expect that it is someone like Rutimi Akiri Dulu that will be having punitive cost of education? That's like you could never have believed that would happen. Therefore, that's a very big chunk issue for young people. You can have uh, uh, issues around health and education, and you think you won't have issues. Therefore, we believe that it will be counted. We want a clean election. We want an election where people will have the right to come and vote, and then we'll see and we'll accept the outcome if it obviously favors, and I believe it will favor us. On the issue of the violence, I believe that the Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces, who also doubles as our President, President Momodou Buhari, has done, or at least has spoken publicly, the way he ought to speak, which is to say that he has given clear instruction to the military that their business in Ondo is to make sure that there's peace and to tolerate no brigandage. And from what we are hearing from the men who have come, who are likely going to be the ones operating on the field, I have a very strong feeling that it's a bit like a volcano in a teacup. I believe that when we get to Saturday, people are going to see that a show of force and the security condoning off of the place by the police and all of the other paramilitary organizations will reflect that no one will tolerate misbehavior. The campaigns are all but over. It closes by tomorrow. Therefore, everything that needs to be said, all of the shenanigans should be over. People should now be allowed to go out and exercise their franchise. And I believe that truly and truly, 888, it is Ayutayo's time. We're going into Alagbaka because we have a purpose to deliver governance at a different level. Right. Well, all seems well on the PDP front nationally because it's been reported that your candidate has the support of 16 PDP governors who are going to converge in Akure and support him. However, it's also reported that there are some fractions within the PDP in Ondo State that are not terribly pleased with your candidate. We all know that all politics is local. How would that affect him? Because there are factors that have been you know, reported that since the party primaries, some people have felt disenchanted, and also with his choice of running mate, that didn't go across too well. How is that going to affect him? Well, um, with politics, there are two or three times when political environments are charged. One of them is when they are doing the, uh, the primaries of a political party. One of them is when they are picking delegates to be escorts. One of them is when they are trying to do the actual election. But each of these processes, PDP has been lucky. We have been able to create a robust reconciliation structure that is standing, and they go on from time to time to calm the free nerves. What I have seen on ground here is that the enthusiasm of the mass of the people, the people of Undo, the market woman, the teacher, the student, the artisan, the farmers, has dwarfed whatever small decibel of noise coming from individuals in their stakeholder capacity. And I also know very well that the territorial commanders of PDP, I mean those men who have become large within the state, all of them are on board. When you get the, the campaign, the, the, the issues that, that came up after the primaries was a little bit, as should be expected, eight people contested for that ticket. And all of them went all the way to the ballot. So you should see that that means that they know that people love PDP and the platform is desirable. Only one of them has gone to look for a governorship ticket in Zenith Labour Party. But hey, the Leopard will not change his, his spot. That is the same candidate who, didn't, who was not satisfied with being deputy governor in APC, who was not satisfied with being runner up of the presidential, of the governorship primaries in PDP, and probably will go to Zenith Labour Party. So we people have a right to of their association and they can be responsible for their decision. But I believe very strongly that the PDP is here as one family. Like you've alluded to, all our big players, all our big giants, all the governors of our party are on board. Wiki, everybody here, Atiku Abubakar, everybody. We're one house running towards Undo 2020. And by the grace of God, we're looking forward to victory. All right. Uh, I just want to quickly ask you this. You've been talking about the narrative. You said your narrative had become a, a, a play and a song and a dance and everybody's singing it in the state. What's the narrative of uh, Itaio Jagede as regards what he's going to do? And I also want you to analyze for me the Mimiko factor. 
Will it, you know, split okay, out the first thank you. some areas? The ITAR, the ITAR Jagede narrative is very simple. Eta Ojegede, like every decent Ondo person, believes that education has been the preeminence of Ondo, and therefore anything that will affect education cannot be tolerated. In that regard, we believe that education must be both qualitative and affordable, for education gives everybody, the son of the rich, the son of the poor, an access and an opportunity to make a future for themselves. Therefore, we are very big on education. We are also very, very big on health because we know that human capital development indicates that the critical things you need to ensure is that once you are able to have a healthy population, you are able to educate the healthy population, then you are able to make the human resource of your people, create the future you want for them, and therefore you can then have the resources to be able to build so we're heavy on health care. We are also very, very heavy on agriculture, and our approach, Itao Jagede's approach, is slightly different from the typical, oh, we like agriculture approach. Our approach is simple. Itao Jagede believes that the first thing we must do is have an audit of those that are already farming, not new farmers, not uh, 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 people who say they want to be farmers, but they don't really want to be farmers. We're talking about people that are farming already. Because our survey has revealed that the problem we have with agricultural management in this country is that you put the policies somewhere else and you put the executors of the policies somewhere else and the real farmers are left in between. So we're going to do an audit of the farmers, know the level of accurate they are doing now, figure out, sit down with them to see how we can improve and expand what they're doing with giving them seedling, doing the clearing for them, providing subventions and all that. And then we're going to do one thing extra which is provide government as a buyer of last resort, as an uptaker. And on the tail of that... Right, I, I, I think we'll, we'll still get more comments from Shang Shomi there. We just uh, lost a quick signal. So he was talking about agricultural uh, policy. He was talking about government be a buyer of la last resort. Um, and when he said that, Dr. Abati, correct me if I'm wrong, my mind just went to the boards. Is he saying that they're going to be having you know, agricultural boards again, because it's only the board system that it makes it easier for the government to buy from you your produce and in turn uh, sell in return. So I'd like to, you know, question him on that and, and see uh, uh, other parts of this uh, narrative he's, he's been talking well, about. Well, the commodity as boards yeah. never worked. Yeah. Um, and that's why we say that, look, we tend to refer to agriculture uh, only as an aspiration. Uh, I think since... Uh, mm. General Basson just said Operation Feed the Nation. Um, not, uh, no other government has really shown enough uh, commitment. And it's even worse at the state levels. We all talk about agriculture, agriculture will create jobs. We all know the theory. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the truth of the matter is what is the uh, Workability. result uh, for a country that is so blessed, you know, and yet we've not been able to figure it. And many of the people who talk about agriculture, they are still at the level of subsistence farming. Yeah. In some states, they have these schemes. They say they'll give you agricultural land, you know, so that you can have access to land. But it goes beyond land. Yeah. So, but what we need is good thinking. Yeah. Whether we are talking about agriculture or health or education, the big problem that we have had is that we've not seen enough in terms of good thinking at all levels. Don't let us always blame uh, the federal government. But as for the election on Saturday, we, we should appeal to the people of uh, Ondo State and the political gladiators to give peace a chance. For the uh, INEC chairman to have said the environment is tense, the environment is charged, there must be something that he has seen. Uh, but of course, we know that they have uh, 33,000 plus uh, policemen uh, to look after uh, over 300,000 uh, polling units in about 203 uh, uh, wards uh, in 18 uh, local governments. Well, so I hope that there will be enough in terms of uh, security logistics to ensure that nobody is allowed to take the law uh, into his or her hands. And he made a good point about how INEC, having succeeded in a do state, you know, a do state, there was this fear that, oh, yeah. there will be a blowout. Mm -hmm. But that blowout did not happen. We are also hoping that, that there will be no blowout in Ondo, Ondo State. You recall Ondo State is particularly notorious uh, for violence uh, during elections and after elections. Everyone will remember the, uh, the Second Republic case, the, uh, the Ajaxi Omoburi Owo case, yes. when 
the whole community uh, exploded, and uh, even uh, Ondore Radio was fighting uh, the Federal Radio Corporation, yeah. and there was violence on the streets of Ondo State, where at the time we were told uh, this mythological tale about how houses were burnt with ordinary eggs. Egg. That it's people will throw an egg <laughs> at a building or a location and it will go up in flames. That uh, myth uh, persists, but I hope this time around nobody is stockpiling eggs or guns Very or bullets, good. you know, and that there will be peace. And that whatever the outcome is, uh, that, uh, you know, whoever is involved will accept the outcome uh, in good faith. If Akre Dolu loses, we expect him to congratulate the opposition. And if the opposition loses, we expect that they will take it in good faith, that the people have spoken. All right, and let's peace reign. And that's all on today's edition of The Morning Show. And thank you very much, Shogun Shoumi, if you are still uh, watching. Thank you. Still the Arise News Channel.